trying to do the, I'm starting with just the same thing we did last week, go through some configs. <laughs> a lot of the emphasis last week was on what's in the actual doc files, and probably me more than anyone, I, I don't like having a big doc file config. I'd rather have plugins that I can just compose together. So I'm going to start with uh, the plugin I made to, ena to enable out of this, which is sensible.bin. It's a plugin that's just a bunch of defaults so that when you're first... For one, when you're first getting started with them, or you're pairing on a machine and you don't have a common ground or anything, just some very simple universal defaults so that you're not immediately having to jump in and get, you know, Janus or whatever. So, uh, yeah. And along those lines, I also have a sleuth.vim, uh, which is a plugin to handle all the indent settings where it can just automatically detect. Rather than having, I see a lot of configs where you've got you know every file type mapped to a lot of indent, which is which is fine. That's how I started, but it it, it gets tedious to anything, and then that's something you have to have whenever you, whenever you set up a new system. So this just automatically detects that um, you know it sees two space and then two space. And uh, one thing that unique characteristic it has: if I create a new a new file in here, and uh, if I, uh, it automatically detects the two-space event and then it's like, all right, this is a new file. I'll go look at uh, other files in that directory. All right, I guess I'm going to, instead of trying to start by editing my own plugins, I'm going to, I, uh, I went looking for, since I'm, much of my professional career has been Rails, I went looking for a uh, simple Rails app I could demo and it just worked out of the box. And the only thing I could really find was this this side by crush that is like some uh, Nick Quarantino. That's a uh, it's like a some unofficial band fan site. So, <laughs> <laughs> but it actually works. It's on the latest version of Rails, and, and I don't know I, the open the most popular open source apps out there by definition are very old and have a lot of stuff in them, and I couldn't even get half of them running. So, yes. Yeah, yeah, set list. There was a there was a parser that I know that, that had a. So uh, what do I want to show? Uh, so uh, test running. I guess that, that that's a big one that I saw a lot of, and I never saw anyone demo. Uh, you know, my favorite child, Dispatch.vim. So it's just a. I mean, it's an asynchronous test runner, and. So I've got a mapping for it, D enter, and it, it runs the test and loads the results in the quick fix list so that if you have a failure, let's uh, throw something in there that fails. And it, instead of just showing it in another window, it actually loads uh, the error message. It's like, here's, uh, there's where our error is. Yes. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Another thing about those configs a lot is they're very. A lot of the existing test runners out there, I, I found very constraining because they'd be like, "All right, this is a test runner for Ruby running in Tmux with a vertical split," which I, I don't. I don't like being constrained that way. Sometimes I end up running in Mac then, particularly when I'm pairing. I don't want someone to have to learn a, a Tmux setup when I'm teaching someone. I'm, they're already having to deal with Ben because you're pairing with me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So if I like start Mac then. Let's see, do we? It, it will How still you, run over here. What did you do? Oh, all right. Good question. Colon <laughs> 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 GUI? Yes, colon GUI will start up the GUI over a. Uh, from, from a command line, then it will start the GUI. So let's Is there a plugin that does that, or is that just. That's built in. <laughs> And I don't remember how you full screen our Mac then, so there we go. Command to enter, I think. That's what I'm hitting. I hit it like five yeah. times. I think like a minute. Oh, well, yeah. It's not a default. Size up. I do, but I don't remember those keys either. What? Like, uh, they're yeah, maximized. Yeah. I know how to do that. Uh, Shotgun out. Yeah. <laughs> Call and do what I want. So, yeah, any, any, yeah, so. <laughs> Do that. I do that, and it's running over here in uh, in the terminal. There's like a, so it's actually because I started from Tmux, it's running inside of Tmux. But if we go back there and like start a new tab, demo Skyway, and what were we in? Park. 
Sure. So now if I could have just started the GUI, but now if we do it, let's actually get out of full screen over here. Size up. Now. There we go. So yeah, it supports that, it supports screen, it supports Windows. We're just wanting to kill this problem once and for all. And in addition to that, it supports like uh, commands to just start a terminal or whatever. And in Tmux, it would start a Tmux session. But if we start the Rails console over here, mm -hmm. so and then it, it's also item component. This is one thing I. This is a recent thing I ran into, because lately I found myself working a lot of like SOA apps where I'm running three different apps, and I I cannot keep up with three different terminals. My limits too. <laughs> so I've got it. So yes, if you hit console, it will go back to the console. So if I get lost, I can always find my console. All right. So let's go back to the dispatch thing again. How did you run that? Okay. So I've been using uh, yeah colon dispatch, and the dispatch has a default task. So this is something provided by Rails.vim. So the default task here is it wraps the colon rate command, which in turn has a default task to, yeah, showing you exactly the command it's running. If you can read that. I may need to go back to running in Tmux just so we can read. Uh, all right. When it finishes running, it will show the command at the bottom. Yeah, so te rate, test units, test. That's what, that's what Rails.vim does. I'm going to start by showing a lot of Rails.vim. That's where I cut my teeth. I've started trying to generalize a lot of these things, and I'm going to try to hit on that at the end. So, all right. Uh, let's, let's go back to a failure again. The next plugin I'm going to show is uh, Unimpaired. Uh, Unimpaired has... This is one of those... That's hard to explain. A lot of people don't even know about it just because it's one of those things you don't think you need. It's not like, oh, I, I want to plug in for Git or whatever. This is a something you, it's a workflow change. It's hard to think about. Um, so here, basically, it's called an It's got a bunch of pairs of mappings. In particular, I'm starting with, if you can use, it's got bracket Q and bracket, uh, the two bracket Qs to cycle through the quick fix list. So here's all the different errors. Here's all the different things in the stack trace for cycling through just by hitting bracket Q. Um, going through other things. Cycle just through files and go to the next file in the directory. Uh, conflict markers. Add blank lines. Switch lines. Toggle options. Turn on numbers or off. How did you get to this list? This is just uh, help unimpaired. So, yeah. And unimpaired is uh, its own plugin. It's not part of real time. It, it's its own plugin, yes. You know about uh, Vim sub mode? Uh, what is it? Vim sub mode. I do not. So if you pair sub mode with an unimpaired, sub mode is like it'll let you take a key and then it'll basically lock the key. So if you, you can have a sub mode for a closed bracket, and then every letter that you press will be as if the square Ooh, bracket is. That sounds pretty hot. Yeah. There's also a Vim space, which is similar, where you can bind the, it binds space and backspace to whatever motion you made most recently, which is in that spirit. All right. It's a bunch of pasting mappings I won't go through right now. It's got also even sub just mode. some weird stuff, XML encoding. I need something that can actually be encoded, but... All right, well, we'll show URL encoding. Which I, and more importantly, decoding, which I find helpful a lot of times. Oh, really? That's an unimpaired? Uh, yes. <laughs> I think I have another And then, like, if you want to quote a string, if we, uh... It wraps it like a string with the backslash ends and all that and escapes your quotes. Alright, so just jumping around. Commenting is something I found that I could... There are a lot of commenting plugins out there. I couldn't find one that... 
A lot of them seem very obsessed with like making those little boxes of stars and slashes that you get like in C code or whatever, which I have never found to be a pain point and seem to you know give less attention to just commenting out code. I wanted to just be able to hit one keystroke and like comment out a paragraph. So that's just GC go comment AP a paragraph. And like GCU to undo comment a paragraph. That's a very simple plugin. What's the name of that plugin again? Uh, commentary. Oh wow. Next time I'm gonna come up with some segues, but for now you just got to bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> Surround is manipulating strings. We want to change just a single quoted string, CS double quote, single quote. You can like just delete the quotes, wrap a whole line and parentheses, just stuff for manipulating those. Endwise, in that spirit, adds uh, ends in languages like Ruby, so it automatically adds the end at the end. Uh, it works in a few other languages, like my favorite, Vinscript. What's the thing that makes it do end into uh, oh, curly braces? So that is a plugin not by me. Uh, the Blockle the is a uh, special case version. The one, my, my favorite is, uh, what's it called? Split drawing. So I'm going to hit right. G capital J, and it seemed to screw up the spaces there. But yeah, the basic idea, it can, yes, it converts several different things. It works in several different languages. You open up like a plugin. This is no longer commentary. Which one is this just to follow on? I don't even remember. Split joint. Split joint is the name of the plugin. Split joint up. Uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm going to go show it, show it on another file. It uh, splits and joins lines, and it has support for, like, this, this file does not have a, a good example. Let me, let me just write one. Uh, so if I hit GJ, it combines it into a, a one-liner, and then GS, split it back. And, it, yes, it supports several different languages, which shows good. So... Let's go look at a random plugin. So, uh, VimScript has this funky line continuation syntax. So if I have GS here, it puts the backslash in, and GJ joins it back. And there are, I, I, I don't even know the, the full set of languages, but it's large. Um, all right, let's pick something else. How, how do you navigate between VimPanes and TXPanes? Uh, I don't use a lot of TMX pains just because I find that painful. <laughs> oh, no. Get him out I of here. I came up with that, yeah. Get him out of here. That is scripted something. <laughs> the uh, uh, let's see if I even remember how to create one. <laughs> the, yeah, there's a TMX pain. And how do I switch? I don't remember. Uh, there yeah. we go. Control Z J is set up. If you if you bind them so that the key bindings are the same as them, I find that less confusing because then you just hit your prefix key and now everything that you do will do T mux not them. So you bind like K, which is equivalent of like Control W K and Vim. If you do Control A K to be your movement for T mux pains, then it sort of makes sense. I just like my like do Control A, Control A to like do T mux. Yeah. Window management is hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. I actually have shift bound to, to cycle through TMX paint, which works great as long as there's two or less. Two is kind of my limit for a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> as long as I can toggle, I'm okay. Other than that, I get lost. So what up? All right, so I, I guess I'll just show a little more of Rails.vim. Get out of here. So and this is like the, my, the plugin where I, I first started learning VimScript because, uh, I mean, this is like when, you know, DHH had that screencast, look at all the stuff I'm not doing, and it was all, <laughs> all TextMate, and everyone loved TextMate. So, so yeah, I, I, I was like, well, someone needs to make a, a, a Vim plugin for this, and I waited a month and no one had so I just dug in. <laughs> now, yeah, That's the cut off a month. 
I, I didn't time it, but yeah, it was a long <laughs> spiral after that. <laughs> All right, so there's a, several things in here. So it, the dispatch stuff is my new abstraction. It started with just like the rape, the rape command, which runs the rape task, and it has the defaults to like run the current task. All right, there's no te there's no test for this file. So oh, no. <laughs> Doesn't matter. We already saw that. It's okay. Uh, there's also um, <laughs> my answer to the fuzzy finder was navigation commands. Like if I want to edit a model, too much typing. Um, I have a e model command to find a you know playlist search. I, I can tap the playlist. I can find it and it and it segments them. Fuzzy Finders in particular, they have a huge advantage of just working on any project. So, so I, I get why people would go to them, but having having this work where, where it's like if you got a, a search model, and I, I don't know this app, but I bet there's a search, yeah, there's a search controller and a search is test, and... What's E versus R? I always use R. Uh, I started with R because I was thinking Rails. As I've tried to make it more of an abstraction, I've named it E for edit. So I'm R slowly works. phasing out R over the coming years. <laughs> so yeah, so that's where I started, and then we can switch to a, uh, another project, I guess. Uh, so do you not use any fuzzy finders? I have Control P. I tend to use it. I mean, on oddball projects that don't have a specific layout, I will use it. Generally, I mean, I generally I find myself in like a Rails app or a Clojure Linigan app or or a Vim plugin or. Something in one of a handful of templates, and I tend to use navigation commands there. Uh, so let's open up, like, so after that, yes, I found it. Oh, okay, I want this on, like, a, uh, on, like, a plain old Ruby gem. So I made rape.bam, which has the same idea. elib, edit a lib. A lib. There's a, a runner command, all the same ideas. And we can keep going to, like, uh, I now have a... Same, so the same day when I started learning Clojure, I, had, I made Fireplace for that. So if we look at like a Clojure app. For Clojure. Yes, it's, it's like a learning site for Clojure, very meta. <laughs> same idea, this should work. Or not. Um, so I'm, I may need to uh, start the... Or not that console. Oh, that's why this file doesn't have any tests. <laughs> Let's find a test. No, oh, well, I, it, it, as far as I'm concerned, my stuff's working. Something here's not working. <laughs> I don't know. Is that dispatch that's giving you capital C console? Um, it's uh, it's another thing wrapping dispatch. So that this is the thing I'm I'm currently building. Like Rails.vim has a console command, and uh, Lineagain.vim has a console command to start line wrap. I'm trying to make that the next abstraction because after I do that and everything has a console command, now I've got it like map. Where I could just hit DC and it takes me to the console. Can you override that command? Like if you use like I use a favorite box, so I can't just do browse console. Uh, I mean, you should definitely be able to define your own. I don't know how that will work in like the context of the Rails plugin, but yeah, I'm definitely trying to make that generalizable. And I've got it work. I've got it like where I can. Uh, it can also find like an arbitrary bin slash console, which is a convention I've seen for one-off projects. And it will just run that. And all the stuff for like finding it is uh, uh, you know, tooling agnostic. It should work for anything. So does it just have like a series of callbacks in it favored? Uh, well, right now it's just uh, one, it's just each plugin is providing its own. Uh, the thing I am, I have started building to, because now, now, now that I've had to re-implement this, a lot of this like three times, I've decided it's time to generalize it. So. I have started a plugging I may need to remit help tags. Projectionist, where you can just define the, the layout of your project. And you can define like here's your, how your default dispatch task works. 
Here's, here's how you, here's what the make utility is, and, and it's just, that way you've just got a few lines and, you, and you've got a cool tooling around all this. And, and that's what I'm trying to build a console into, tell it what your console command is, and it just works. I haven't, I don't have something that does that just yet. Just like some ad hoc stuff in my VimRC. But that is coming. How about the other side? So one thing that, uh, so you, you have like Clojure and Ruby. Mm -hmm. Uh, for testing. Mm -hmm. So one thing I tried to build one time was a thing that generalized across file types for like find the closest test, find the closest test class, and find the current test suite. Have you thought about that? Because like, cause like dispatch, if you want like dispatch, right, so you have like dispatch test runner and then the mm -hmm. test that you run to run. That's going to differ across projects and across languages. Okay. Okay. So yeah. So the so the so the idea is that you define what your test file. For, all right. So you define an alternate file. So the this is something I first added to Rails up then, but it has spread to everything. There's, there's a version in a projectionist where it can just alternate between your test and your implementation. And the second part is defining the uh, what the command is to run your test. So you can see that with uh, what's focused. That's uh. So this is like project do, which is a component of a projectionist to say, make sure this is the current directory. Run the test in uh, foreclosure.test.core. So just by defining that the alternate file is test.core and how you run test.core, it's hooked up the default dispatch test. So now if we hit D enter, it'll probably give us that same error. Yes. <laughs> but that's separate from the closure from the Rails implementation of test finding, presumably? Yes. So, uh, so Rails, Rails being our first plugin has its own, all its homegrown stuff. Lots of special cases for doing all that. When I made lineagain.vim, which is what maps between your test files here, it's just using projectionist. It's a plugin for projectionist. It says, all right, the test, for, the source whatever, look in these three spots. Source, source, test foo, and it looks in a test directory or a test at the end, or a spec directory, all, like four different con conventions I've seen. And, and that and that alternate file doubles as what it uses for how to run the test. That's line again. Not line again, and named after the uh, uh, the closure tool. Line again at the same name, which is their project tool. Which is just this. Uh, if you make your project impossible to spell, you don't have to deal with support. Mm -hmm. Sounds good to me. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, let me find something else. I'll divert and show uh, the tool I use for making Vim plugins because it kind of follows the same pattern with a lot of social cases. Everything needs to be sourced inside of Vim instead of spawning an internal, an external tool. So I have scripties. <laughs> <laughs> Which has uh, just a uh, all the sorts of things I've I've found use, uh, useful in developing plugins. So like syntax highlighting, it, it's hard when you try to debug what's going on. It's not to know what is the syntax highlighting cursor. So I added something to tell you that's a help special being highlighted there. If you were making a help file syntax highlighter, you could you could know what was going on there. This is like to actually look up help. Let me uh, just open up a open up a plugin. So you want to know what the finish command is, hk, and it takes you to colon finish. Gbang, that's like if you want to have actually a bound expression. Here's some stuff to actually hook into the break pointer. This arm is a cool one. I can like say, uh, this, this I find useful both for debugging the plugin and also finding out like if, like if I've got trouble with, a, you know, I've got, it's Clearly, two plugins are interfering, and it's hard to tell which ones they are. I can disarm a plugin. Uh, so, pick up. Uh, what disarm, disarm nerd tree, somewhere? and now I don't have a nerd tree command. Mm -hmm. Scripties. 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 It's like a pretty printer. Like I want to, I want to see what's inside this fugitive buffer object, which is the, uh, the 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 internal object for how fugitive works to so manage a buffer, and just pretty prints it out. Functions. I'm a fugitive then. May as well. I'm running through everything else pretty quick. It's the most useful 
Runtime to reload a plugin, which is very helpful. Script names just to see what has been loaded and what order they're in. See, Vim has a built -in. So a lot of these are wrapping built in just to make them less painful. So there's this, but you just kind of, you know, you got to page through it by hand. You can't search it, you can't copy it. So this just wraps it up and puts it in a window and makes it easy to jump to files or whatever. Time how long something takes. Vim has this verbose feature where you can see what exactly was going on. So normally you would turn on and run a command and run it back off. This just wraps it up and then captures it. So five verbose, edit, reload the file. And this is everything that's happening when you're uh, reloading the file. Looking for all these files. A lot of stuff happens. Something that easily, you've seen me use this when I just load something out of the on the runtime path. Rather than having to go to where it's installed, I just say plugin slash scripties. There's several variants of that. That's about it. All right, let's go to Fugitive. So where do we want to start with Fugitive? Tell people what it is. That might help. <laughs> it's got the word git in it because it works with git. It was either that or agitate, and I think that might have been a better choice, but... <laughs> <laughs> so it's also pretty basic. Just, just wrap up a command to... wraps up like the git command. And a lot of this does stuff in a way that, like, even if you're in it, if you edit something from, like, a different directory, it will still use the right git command, right path for that directory. So I just want to git log or whatever. Load that up. This is a little status wrapper. We'll change something, and look, it's changed. Now it's staged or unstaged. A whole bunch of stuff there. I can come back to this if that's interesting. But. I think git diff is great. Blame and diff is the best. I use that so much. Yeah, I was definitely saving blame. But, <laughs> but you ruined it. Sorry. So there, there's that blank line we added. And you can, uh, I come over here and use diff put to, to stage it. Or undo that. Or on this side, you can do like a diff get. Vim, Vim has all this built in support for diffing. Fugitive just hooks it up so it creates like the. The uh, git stage where it has everything ready for the next commit, it just, it just edits the verb file as it is at that stage. So that you can, uh, and then just operate it on another file, you write it, it, it stages it. So now if we go look at the status, it's now staged. Blame is probably uh, the, the surprise one for me, how often I use it. I can, you can open up a blame, find a change you're looking for for something that's not from the first commit. Mm -hmm. And if we hit enter, we go to where it was added. Here's the diff. And you can like go, okay, well this is the line I was actually trying to look at, so let's go here, and now you can see it in context and history. So when you said, you, let's go here, what keys do you Oh, I'm sorry, I, that would help. I'm hitting the enter key. Yeah. Do, you have, do you have key caster or something awful like that that you can turn on so you can? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> I, I could divert and install it, that seems like a poor use of all of our times. Yeah, I had it like three machines ago, if that helps. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so, and then we get, and then we say, oh, well, here, here, this is just, it just got moved around, this is what we're actually looking for, so, G blame again, the cycle continues. Uh, I guess th this is one thing I use as a good example. Like I, I hear, I see two polar opposites in people who do Vim config. Either they go out, you know, you get Janus, and then twelve more plugins, and everything in the world. Uh, and and it, what happens when you do that is you eventually run into a giant conflict. And then a lot of times people rush it back to the other end. Well, I, I don't use plugins, and I and I kind of and I kind of get where they're coming from. You know, it's like I want to be able to do this from the command line. I don't want to be dependent on a tool. And there, there's a point to be made there, and I, I get why you might want to, you don't really need a status window just to see what's, what changed. But when you do something like this from the command line, it is very painful. If you have to, like, copy, I mean, you got to copy the line number, blame, then you got to do this. There's a huge workflow win just in having this stuff at your fingertips. Don't even have to go to get What I also find really helpful is uh, when you pull this up and, like, go to the commit message, you'd be like, well, why the hell was this added? And then if we're actually writing a couple of commit messages, 
you know, hopefully it explains it. Oftentimes it doesn't do it, but. I use it just to illustrate why commit messages are so important. Yeah. Because I do this all day long, and when I see added shit as the commit message, I get so pissed off. I have a yeah, thing or two to say about commit messages. <laughs> I use it for reblame at parent, which I don't even know how to do on the command line. Like What's if you're that? in that window and you hit tilde, then it'll reblame the line. Like when you know, Oh yeah, so I, let me do that too. Let's go back into. I don't. I don't even know how to do that with Git. Uh, and I don't so feel like finding out. We're in this older version of the README, and we gblame it. So we go here, and we're gonna say, well, what did it look like right before we changed that line? And I hit tilde, and now we see that the previous line was whatever was in the first commit. That's what the carrot means. You can keep hitting tilde to go all the way on back. Yeah, I mean this is the end, but we could get tilde on this one, and that's the beginning. But yeah, I, I, a lot of that has been replaced for me by just the uh, open up the diff and actually see, see, because you can see, oh, the, so if we open up this diff, you can see, oh, well, we changed it, but if it's just a, a, a so what even what even changed here? It was just like a one character change. I can't even see. I added back ticks. I did add back ticks. I changed them to single quotes. So yeah, so you can see, and, and sure enough, big quotes. But if that's not what I'm looking for, I'm like, all right, well, let's blame it here. So I open that up and G-blame it again. And now the original version, yes, that was from the uh, beginning. Uh, another one I use a lot is uh, G-grep. Which it, it just wraps git grep, which has is generally my favorite tool. I, I hear a lot about like ACK. I love how people tell me that ACK is so fast because then you check and it's not gripping half of their project. ACK isn't that fast. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're I'm glad we're in the era of Ari G because at least that's a, that's actually a step up. Server surfer. Where is G grep part? Ggrep is part of Fugitive. It wraps Gitgrep. <laughs> AG has a bunch of annoying things, though. I'm not seeing good company with that uh, act then. All right, so yeah, Ggrep. Glog. This this was one that was less useful than I thought, but we'll try it. Uh, it's still useful to show the history of the files. I use this a lot. Open that up again. <laughs> So yeah, it shows, it's showing it in this, this hideous format that's designed to get loaded into the commit list. But after it gets loaded, you can just cycle through each commit that touched this file, and it shows you down here with the, at the bottom the, the commit message. So you can walk through the changes. And I did not mean to quit the entire thing. So... Log... Yeah, this is a, uh, I have a lot of different variants of this where I just, I want to, I, I don't remember my current directory, but I want to edit something relative to the git root. So that's what that family commands is. Gread. So it is very common, you know, you, you've made a bunch of changes and you just want to go back to where you started. So, uh, and you can do a git checkout, but then all, you lose all your history, there's no way to get that back. If you just do gread, it's the same thing, except it's part of your them history, and you can undo it. G right stages the file, variants of that. What did you do? It's a rename and remove wrappers. G move is very useful. All right, well, we can rename this something else if we want. First, let's restore it. But uh. G browse, we can just well in another file. Another file. Well, in an ideal world that would have I wonder if it's because I'm running in Tmux. It did not open open in the browser. Or did, I have, or did it? No. <laughs> I can't see. I can't handle more than two things. This is, took me four attempts to tab back, but I got it. What did you try to do? I tried to g-browse it. Oh, to get them. Mm-hmm. It works for me as you want. Yeah, it, I, I thought it did for me too. I guess I hadn't tried it lately. 
last 24 hours. I use that a lot because you can then highlight the lines and send Yes, I, I do it all. I have, if we pop out, it's not. Nice. No. Well, it's also got an ability to copy it to the clipboard. You can prove that it. Well, no, it didn't even copy the clipboard. What? Ah, oh, fuck this shit. <laughs> And I believe that file will demonstrate reading <laughs> Alright, so let me remember the thing that. Alright, so that was the end of Fugitive. What else do I have? Bunch of bullshit. Where's the number? Dude, dude, I use get add and get commit a lot. Uh, yeah, she write just stages right. the file so we can bring back that deletion we just did. Oh, I want to commit this separately. G write and G mm -hmm. commit right then. And I also will just fire off my get add dash p. No changes. Uh, so this is my alternative to nurture. I've got I've got a uh, so that Drew Neal wrote this article that I could maybe find or not. Uh, I'm not even on the internet. No wonder the freaking G browser isn't working. <laughs> so it's overrated. So anyway, it's, uh, it, it's talking about how when you nerd tree being one of those things that coming from another editor, you feel like, oh, I need a tree. It's the sidebar, but it it kind of it once you have that, it's doing a lot of tricks to uh, maintain a split. And when you have two splits open, you have that. Which split does it open in? It's basically antagonistic to using splits just in general. So, so my uh, uh, Ben has a built-in browser of his own. It's just like it's a very rudimentary one, and it's missing the tree aspect, which which can be helpful. Is that exp? Uh, it's a netrw. Yeah, if you use explorer, it's uh, the same thing. So I was like, I just want to make that really easy to get to. So I've just got a dash map that goes up to here. So if I want to jump over to another file, I can just hit dash, and then, then I'll get a list of the current directory. I can hop up as much as I need to. And that, that, ha that has largely filled my need for a tree. It's not a one-for-one -one replacement, but it solves a lot of the problems that NerdTree has. What does so, from, from your perspective, what are those problems? <laughs> So the, the whole antagonism towards splits is, is the main one. Uh, do I have that open? So if I've got this, and I've got both of these open, if I, if I open a file over here, where is it going to open? At the bottom, just because I happen to be there last. It, it's, it can get unwieldy to you. So, if you end up using Nurture, what you end up doing is using like tabs instead because you can't, it's hard to use these here. Not to mention, not to mention you can do weird stuff like you open a help window and and it will pop up above the tree. Is that what you wanted? It, it just, it can get awkward to work with. So, I'm, as I said, you, you, it, it, the nerd tree is superior for like, uh, if you're trying to like, you know, you've got a brand new project and you want to actually open up little trees and subdirectories and all that, it can be helpful then, but for the basic browsing, I have found that to be replacing, a more than adequate replacement. Um, what else? What gives me B-tab edit? I use that all the time. What did I just do in... <laughs> yeah. What is yeah. T Mux's obsession with clocks? It's like an Android or something. It's just I, every every screenshot I hate has a clock in the sidebar. I don't. I don't. I also don't know how to. There we go. <laughs> just hitting any, any key is fine. Why is it so? I'm not even hitting a T Mux. I'm hitting Control G. Did I set that up? Maybe I set that up in T Mux. I'm always. So I'm basically a hold down screen, but my, my screen is dead, so I've been reluctantly moving over. It had a release this year, didn't it? 
Yeah, they, they uh, finally had like a point release or something. No, I thought they finally pushed out the official vertical split release. Not that it's not dead. It is dead. Yeah. So I was going to. I was using some map I thought I had for creating a timestamp, but we'll just create it by hand. I'm just showing speed dating. This is this is the plugin where I decided that okay, I'm, this is not just me solving an edge. This is me creating because. Vim has this built-in feature where you can, you know, control A to increment a number, control X to decrement, which is great until you get a date. So this is, yes, it, it does, it does, uh, basically I re-implemented stir up time and stir time. <laughs> this, is, this is, like I said, where I decide I'm creating art. This is, <laughs> I put way more into this than I will ever get out of it, but. <laughs> Roman numerals. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it knows the names of the months and everything. June, July. That's awesome. Yeah, I think I may be the end of the stuff I thought might be cool to write on this note card I brought. <laughs> what was that like again? Speed dating. That's also when I decided naming things was kind of important to me. <laughs> What's your latest plugin? Um, released? I guess yeah. it would be. I guess the Line Again plugin, which in turn is being productionist. So that, that's what I, I haven't cut a release, but I want to do that soon because I, I, I see like because even if you ignore the navigation commands, which you could prefer, uh, I could see the argument for a fuzzy finder. One day I may write a fuzzy finder, then I'll like fuzzy finders. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that, and I'm also, I've got a couple I'm working on. Uh, one thing I've been working on is I'm opening up projects. I, I'm still getting the hang of this, but it's gonna, so the building shell has something called a CD path, where let's open a terminal, and I want a CD to Vim Unix, and this is over in like source Vim bundle, but since I've got a, it, not my CD path, it knows where it is. So this has been like my uh, technique for navigating around lately, and I've been trying to create an equivalent in Vim. Vim has built-in support, but there's no tab complete, so it's pretty uh, worthless. So I have the same thing over here, open Vim Unix. And the hard part there was the tab complete. Uh, what did I use for that? Yeah, I re-implemented this monstrous algorithm from some Emacs plugin. And Elist is just as terrible as Vimal. It just has a better runtime. So yeah, sorting was the thing that kind of hung me up because now I've got the, I've got I don't want to ship something this big without making it general and reusable. So that's where I'm going with that. I also got a, a stupid trick: uh, extract. So let's say I want to pull this this thing out into its own variable um, uh, pattern. So I change it. And then as part of my paste, I use a special paste binding that puts the let, and it's all like my pattern, so it automatically fills in the let pattern equal. That's going to be a extract dot bin. That, and it's a very simple plugin, like 94 lines. The only challenge is every language is different. I'm not sure if I want to maintain a million mappings for every language. So I'm not decide, I'm not sure if I'm going to have some way to, to configure it, but. That's a very simple and something I found surprisingly powerful. That's not even the right plugin, but whatever. Not very good at tab complete. What's the thing that gives you just string completion? Like, is it some C tag thing? Uh, I mean, there, there are a dozen different completion mechanisms in Vim. It's just built into Vim? Uh, yeah. Oh, I could show, uh, I could show C tag, which fills in the tag and all sorts of things. So, I don't know who here is familiar with C tags, but it's basically a very old tool for building like an index of your source. So, there's only like one function in this file, so it might be the greatest demo. But yes, yeah, so you can hit control bracket, and uh, this is not a committed file, so it's never had C tags run. Cool. 
But let's open up a real plugin. So you generate your tags on commit? Yes, that's what I was building to. So I just so I can hit control bracket and jump to the index. And it's actually got the, the tags are actually stored up in here where it's just got all the functions with the definition. The way I do that, I've got a blog post explaining this. But basically it runs C tags, we carry out to the raw project root, and this is in turn in the my default git template for new projects automatically set up. So now I, I have, I basically, C tags are great, but they're just a pain to give them. They, this basically solves it for me. Except a few cases, like, like when I'm opening up a gym. Let's go back to this, uh, this thing, this guy. So, uh, where is, uh, does this thing use any gems? Surely it does. I don't know where they are. Uh, not in this file. <laughs> not in this file. Not in the... where, where the hell is Active Record? There we go. So yeah, so I've got C tags for gems, and I'm doing that in turn with a, a gem, Ruby gems plugin that generates C tags. And I've got C tags for core Ruby. For most of that, for the parts that aren't C anyway. Where's something that's not C? Mm -hmm. But anyway, I generate tags for uh, built and stuff. I think like I can go to find something. Yeah, there's something in Capybara. Cool. But anyway, I, the point being, I've got the generate. The, the last remaining piece was the Ruby source itself, so that's handled by an RBE implement plugin, which basically has solved that 100 percent for me, at least for Ruby. And then other projects, like I, like Enclosure, that it's got its own own tooling for going with the source or whatever, so I don't need it there. Do anything for JavaScript? Uh, you could use C tags with JavaScript. I haven't done enough of it to for that to have been a pain point for me. I, mean, I, I haven't gotten into the, all the. I haven't really done a, a big, you know, one of these front end framework things yet. But when I do, I'll, I'm sure I'll find a way. If that helps anyone. All right, uh, you ain't got anything else? Let's check that clock again, what time is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's almost an hour. Pretty proud of that. Do you have any desire to talk about Tamal or are you keeping that? Uh, we can try. Uh, do you actually need to? No. Do you actually need to? Do you actually can you keep release release things on the rats? You know what? Yeah. Can you like, keep release things? Well, if you never rest? mention it yeah. after the initial announcement notice, like. So yeah, I mean, I released it on April Fool's Day, not because I intended it as a joke, because, but because it kind of turned out to be one. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it's a pretty substantial implementation of Clojure. <laughs> so map ink list one. I, I don't know. Reduce. <laughs> so, did, didn't Steve Lodish actually port one of his plugins to it? Too? Uh, he did as a proof of concept, yeah. I don't have it with me or internet, so. Uh -huh. But yes, you can take my word for it, he did. Show, show off the Vim interop. Uh, what Vim interop? <laughs> <laughs> it has stuff. I don't remember what. Well, it's got like a scratch buffer, so. <laughs> Look, I can run stuff in there. Like, you can actually, like, call in to, like, set and stuff like that. So, oh, yeah, so... So, yeah, I, I, this is the part that I probably would have been best suited to implement rather than me trying to implement a compiler for some reason. But, so if I said ignore case... Could not resolve colon. So how did I actually implement? I don't even remember. Kind of execute. I pulled out colon because I figured that could be a grander abstraction. That's an ignore case. Now we can check. It's not set. <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. Yeah. Isn't there a set bang that calls into set also? Is there? I don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I started. Uh, yeah, uh, well, there is a set. Oh, set bang is 
Yeah, oh, oh it can you. Okay, so Lisp in general has a set bang that, uh, that, that's, uh, that's where they put all the mutation. Since that's evil, it needs an exclamation point. So you can, call, you can uh, I, I, it interrupts with built in things. So the vim syntax is to put like an ampersand. So if we set bang, ignore case one, that might have said it. Yes, that said it. Woo! I don't know what it is. But yeah, so, there, so yeah, there's a lot of, uh, there's a few rough edges. My concern was that it was, I mean, I'm compiling down to VimScript in VimScript, which is like a very slow abstraction. And, and in addition to that, the closure itself, if you've seen, is, I mean, it's not known for its startup time. And I, a lot of the, everything it does is eager loaded, which is not a good fit for like, um, I mean, Vim, where you're starting it a lot. So I have like a caching compiler, but even like the reader is, is kind of slow. So I think, so I'm implementing another language is tedious, but I mean, there wasn't a lot of design I had to do, except, except like a bit of interrupt. So I, I guess my concern is, I, 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 I feel like a better, there would have been a better language to, to design rather than just blindly aping closure. But whatever, now, now I've implemented a Lisp, which is the best way to learn Lisp. <laughs> All right. Uh, is, is your is your Vim config presumably is open source? To, you know, yes. Find it and go through each of the plugins that you've used. And mm -hmm. So so yeah. So the way I do my Vim config is I start. I mean I started this like, you know, well before I, I was a uh, a master of it. If that makes any sense. So my Vim config, I, I have like vendored like my core plugin to the bias to older stuff before I had really decided what it is. So it's like I want that com I mean, commentary plugin is a very small one I want everywhere. I want dispatch everywhere. Think, especially things like unit K, hey, there's one I didn't show. I'll come back. Uh, so <laughs> that, 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 that one being a, a, a bunch of Unix command wrappers and stuff, which is very useful. I want to, there's some stuff I just want to have, like even if I want to be able to push my doc files up to a server and have something to work with. So my core stuff's there, and then I use Pathogen to install everything else. And that, I don't have vendored anywhere. I just do that ad hoc per machine, because this is the stuff I like care about on my development machine, which I have one or two at a time most. Uh, so, there's all my plugins. How can I scroll up? That's just the ones I wrote. I've got like a separate directory for whatever else I'm using. But those are not in wow. your, That's it? Those, those are vendored in your own vendor configure, they're just they're, they're, well, I mean, they're on my machine. They're not. I don't have those in my doc files, but it's basically all my plugins. So just look at my GitHub. Do you have a good way to keep those up to date? Because I have never up to date. Uh, I mean, not, obviously, I can get pulled from the directory. Not, re not really. So when I designed Pathogen, it was this one was very much a scratch and itch scenario. I need to. I wanted to be able to work on my plugins and commit to them and still have them loaded. So that's why. I mean, that's why it just wraps Git. I would like to see a real package manager. There are a lot of them that have just wrapped up. We run git clone for you or whatever, which is, I, I, I can understand the convenience, but not really a transformative thing. I want something with like dependencies or whatever, which I may or tackle someday, or maybe someone else will tackle it someday. So, I, so yeah, if you're not really doing that, something like bundle is probably a slightly more convenient choice. Although, yes, it basically just runs the Git pull for you. I mean, I, before I came over, because I work on two different machines, I just wrote a little shell script, CD to each pop project and Git pull. That's how I got it. Uh, yeah. You don't, you don't use uh, submodules? No. <laughs> well, so submodules suck, but if you use submodules, then you get, get submodule for each. and then You, you get two problems. Yeah, you get two problems. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So yeah, I think if you want something where you're storing like a manifest of what you use in your config, I would probably recommend something like Bundle. Uh, Alright, talk about Unic a couple minutes. This is such an awesome agenda. So it's a... Uh, I mean, it's mostly simple stuff, but it wraps up things... I mean, 
it tightens a lot of instructions. Like, there, I mean, you can call colon rm bank, or, or, colon rm on a, not colon rm. Let's find something I can actually delete. <laughs> so if you call, so if you call colon rm percent, it works, but then like says, hey, this file is no longer available, and you still got it open. Whereas if we rewrite it, and then we call colon remove, it closes the buffer for you. So that's a lot of things. Colon move, you can move the file, but then you gotta go re-edit the file. So that just, it just wraps up a lot of very simple things. Some cool pseudo Pseudo, right, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, let's see if I can demonstrate that. Uh, yes. So if you that's use, no well, let's not use sudo. This is what I use this for all the time. So I went to edit this host. Where that fucking white space is Yeah, what is that bullshit? <laughs> so then I go to write, and I can't write it, but sudo write, and it gets my password. I type this, it's not going to show on the screen, is. <laughs> so yeah, so that was able to edit the file, and after that I can just call in wbang it. What was the find? Will find give you a list you can jump to? Uh, find, yeah, find wraps the Unix, find, so, let's go back to where I was. This is not an exciting project, so we're going to find, like, one file. Dash name, we should find two files, unit.star. I'm not in this directory. Let's try again. So, yeah, found the two files, and it, like, loads them up, where I can cycle through them using, uh, yeah, bracket Q from unimpaired, or colon CNET, so I can, I can open up the list. Can you do, is it, what's that? Grep also? Grep is actually built in. If you just use colon grep, I think I've got it set to AG now. Like I said, I use ggrep a lot, but I've also, if I'm, if I'm not in a Git project, so grep. No, it's not set to grep. I mean, I have AG on this machine, so. So yeah, so it runs crap, loads in that list, I can just cycle through. Or open up the list. Alright, I guess I'm gonna call it. Time. One, one hour, sure one minute. I don't think this is a plugin, but before you had line numbers up with the offsets, not uh, oh, that is just built in. I, I, I was demonstrating uh, um, unimpaired option toggles. So I had C O R change option relative number, and it just shows you know. And this is designed so if you want to go uh, down three lines, you see that line. I want to, it's three lines. So I had three J and I'm there. So that, that's the use case of that. Yes.